Welcome to Dominate Your Day podcast. This is the podcast that adds value to leaders who want to make a difference in the workplace. We believe each person is unique and has a purpose they can live out every day and make an impact in the world. Here at Dominate Your Day podcast, we hear stories from leaders who have used their unique talents to transform themselves and their companies from the inside out. Welcome to Dominate Your Day. I am thrilled today to introduce you to Angela Burgess. And Angela has done exactly what I love to hear. She has created her own business at the intersection of two of her areas of expertise and passion. And her business is called Broad Oaks. And she helps um, nonprofits and donors work together and come up with an amazing um, opportunity to build and grow to support their community. So welcome to the show, Angela. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be here today. Well, one of the things that I love to do is find difference makers out there who are making an impact, and, and that's you, and get these stories out there. So let's start, Angela, with ex- sharing with the audience, you know, how you got from, I guess you were in finance, to <laughs> where you are now working in, with nonprofits and, and bridging a gap that you saw in the marketplace. So how did that happen? Yeah, well, it, you know, what's interesting, too, is that I double majored in college in Spanish and communication studies, which clearly led to a career in wealth management. I mean, obviously, we all see the connections there. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. So even that was interesting in and of itself. I I loved public speaking. So my communications degree, I had a focus in rhetoric and I loved foreign languages and Spanish was easy for me in high school. And so I decided to make that my double major. And I remember speaking with this gentleman when I was 17 and you know, at the time I, I didn't know what to major in and my parents had some college under their belt, but they hadn't graduated from college. And so I knew this guy kind of casually who was, you know, 22 years old and had graduated from school and seemed to have it all figured out. So I called him for advice. Of course, you know, now I'm like, oh my gosh, I took advice from a 22 year old. Yeah. Um, and I, he helped me figure out that these were things I really liked in school. And I said, but Greg, what do I do with that? And he said, I'll never forget. He told me, don't worry about it. Just be passionate about what you do and the rest will work itself out. And it just made so much sense to me. I think those of us who are a little bit more entrepreneurial in, na- entrepreneurial in nature have a tendency to just think, yes, this makes sense. It's all going to work. And so I just, I followed that. And the largest employer in the state of Iowa, which is where I'm from, when I graduated from college was Principal Financial Group. And I really wanted that kind of stability. You know, I grew up in an era where you went to work for one company and you worked there for your entire life and you saved for retirement and better to align yourself with a larger organization where there's a lot of mobility. Um, Principal did not select me for a second round of interviews, my, my first go round. And so I just submitted a resume every month for a year to them until they finally called me and said, you are not qualified for any of the jobs you've applied for. But we do have a job we think you would be perfect for. And it was in their benefits service department working with institutional 401k. And they needed people to go out and speak to principal's largest 401k clients about enrolling in a 401k, investing in your 401k in Spanish and in English. Oh, well, there we go. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Perfect. It was perfect for me. So I was doing public speaking in both of my languages. And that's really what led into my decades long career in wealth management. Over time, I moved on from that role and became a financial advisor. And then at 25, actually got promoted and started recruiting financial advisors and running my own team. Um, By 27, 28, I had been hired to Smith Barney to run one of their largest offices on the North Shore of Chicago. And I stayed on with Morgan Stanley for a year. You know, I kind of felt like when you look at your life, what are things that are practical that you can combine with things that you are passionate about? So for me, it seemed really practical to learn about investments and money and insurance and all of the things that I knew I would need throughout my lifetime while I was speaking with people and learning to sell and learning to promote myself. The challenge became for me is that I 
the more that I was recruiting and helping advisors grow their businesses, I loved that aspect of it. I loved working with an advisor to be able to take him or her from, you know, generating 500,000 in production credits to one and a half million simply by connecting them with resources and giving them the encouragement. But over time, that work of helping wealthy people become wealthier just didn't align with my value structure. And I reached a point where I wanted my life to mean more and I wanted my work to mean more. So along the same time that I was having that discord, I learned about a nonprofit in Chicago called Mercy Home for Boys and Girls. And they were looking to hire someone to be their director of planned giving. For me, making that transition from for-profit to nonprofit, I did have to put pencil to paper and figure out how much money I spent every month because I'd been successful and never really had to worry about living within my means. I took a 66% pay cut and Mm -hmm. I left the for-profit industry and went to work for Mercy Home. I was still talking to people about their money and their death, right? I mean, these are things I'm always very comfortable talking about. I always say I've been talking to people about their imminent demise since I was 21. So it's an easy conversation for me. But now we were talking about what's the legacy you're leaving behind? What are you teaching your children? What's important to you about your giving? And really helping people connect their money with mission. I loved it. I just absolutely felt at home there. I think when I initially took the leap, I had in the back of my mind, okay, if this doesn't work, if you don't like it, you can always go back. Your licenses don't expire for two years. You can go back into the industry if it turns out you don't enjoy it. But it was so fulfilling to be able to do that for donors and for the organization, but not only that, to see the impact on the kids. Mm, I bet. And so what I love about where we are in your story right now is that you got to do what you did best with the Spanish and the communication. And then you had this great insight that came in to say, just follow your passion. But the one thing I want to make sure that everybody hears that you said was my values weren't aligning with where I was at that moment. So many of us have core values that we haven't unlocked yet. So what were your core values that were coming out at that point? I'm going to tell you something I haven't really shared with anyone publicly. I went through a very difficult relationship and separation. And I I think I really needed help in that moment. And so once I was on the other side of that separation, I realized that there's so much more to life, that we as humans have so much more to give, and that it's critically important to help one another and to uplift one another. I mean, I remember my first Christmas, someone gave me this Christmas tree ornament, and it was one of those, you know, it was like a, it was a a tree ornament, but it was actually a tree itself. And Mm -hmm. then it had little... Um, kind of ball decoration things where you could write the names of people who were important to you. And I think it was kind of meant to be, you know, your family members. But for me in that year, all the people I wrote on that Christmas tree ornament were the people who had been there for me as I was going through this very difficult time in my life. And once I got to the other side of that, I reached this point where I wanted to pay that forward because I knew there were other women out there who were struggling with the same things that I had struggled through. And so it started for me thinking about volunteer work and what kind of work can I do and still do some volunteer work. And as I started exploring that, I realized that for the last decade, and I think this is true of many of us, and there are a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me and figured it out at a much earlier age, but my personal beliefs, my religion, my relationship with God was very separate from my work. So the things that I valued in terms of giving back weren't things that I took into the workplace with me every single day. So I had both, but they were almost like two separate lives and they weren't working together. And that to me was the part that I just reached this place where I felt like my life wasn't in congruence. I wanted my work to reflect who I was and what I valued. And I also wanted my work to make the world a better place. And it just, not to say that there aren't um, extremely wealthy people who are very generous, but by and large, you know, I'm, I'm just finishing 
a book on capitalism, we have this mentality out there about acquiring more and acquiring more and acquiring more, whether it's more money or more things or whatever it is. But the truth is, is that we make the world a better place by what we give, not by what we get. And I wanted to be able to give more in order to receive more. I love that. And I, I hear loud and clear that generosity is is a big core value of yours. And yeah. it, can, it comes out and sometimes in dark times in our life when we don't realize it that, you know, that was a dark time. But look how the beauty that came from the ashes from that that time. And now here you are. Um, and that was when 20. How long ago was that? Oh, my gosh, that would have been in 2008 when that happened. And then okay. in 2011, I guess it was 2011, I left my corporate career to go work nonprofit. And I stayed at that job for seven years. Um, three years I worked in Chicago. And then four years I worked remotely. I commuted from Houston to Chicago. I loved my job so much. And they were so yeah. kind to be able to work with me. And in 2018, I decided to hang out my own shingle. It, that really came about when I, I had gotten to know a bunch of other nonprofit professionals here in the area. And I was kind of the go-to person for all of the advanced gift planning things, you know, like, what do I do about appreciated securities and what are donor advice funds? And should I talk to my donor about a, you know, a, a charitable lead trust or charitable remainder trust? And what is it? And I just, I love all that stuff. I mean, at any given point in time, this is really sad. I'm just going to show you this. Here are um, four different copies of Trust and Estates magazine sitting on my desk. You just I love. I do. I just, you know, I'm like, oh, I want to go back and reference that article and reference that article. I just, I eat this stuff up. I just really enjoy it. Um, And so all my friends were saying to me, you know, you have this, this knowledge and you use it for one nonprofit. What if you hung out your own shingle and that way you could impact so many more nonprofit organizations and have an even greater impact in the world. And that was alluring to me. I mean, just the idea in my own community, in my own backyard, looking here and here, we have 26,000 nonprofits in Houston. Oh my and gosh. I know That's it's insane. Lot. So many of them doing such critical and important work, but unless we really care for them and nurture them and set them up with that foundation for growth long-term, they're not going to be around 10 years from now, 20 years from now to serve. I love that. And I think what you, what I heard in your story is that you saw need you heard from your associates, why don't you do this? Most nonprofits, and I was just at lunch with a nonprofit today saying the very same thing. They, they're they struggling and they yeah. don't, they can't afford to pay someone like you to come in full time, but how cool that you can come in and bring your group and bring all the resources they need. And it's not like hiring one person or six people, right? Yep. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head. Um, when I structured my business, and we have a few different downlines, but the other thing that's really important to me, we don't charge the fees that other nonprofit consulting groups charge. We wanted to create an affordable solution for small to mid-sized nonprofits that really lays that, I, I say it all the time, but let's lay that foundation where you can grow for the next three to five years, substantial growth, you're going to plateau, and then we'll rescope again. Um, we try to keep our fees very, very reasonable, but still provide the baseline of, of what you need. It's not just about a development plan. I mean, you and I were talking earlier about marketing. Nonprofits, they need to invest in marketing. And it's hard to get boards to understand that. But I always say, you know, if you look at Nike or Apple, some of the largest retailers in the world, do they just stop advertising? Like, oh, no, we've got the market share. We're good now. Southwest, right? Once they do so well, but you can't stop. And the number one thing I hear from nonprofits is, oh my gosh, we're the best kept secret in town. If only people knew about us. And I just want to say, okay, well, then you're going to have to invest in some marketing. And I think so many people, when they're looking at where do I donate my money, I hear it all the time, like, well, I don't want any of my money to go to overhead. I want it all to go to program. Programs don't happen on their own. Programs mm -hmm. don't happen in a vacuum. People run programs. Talented people run exceptional programs. And so we have to think more globally about the impact that we have with our dollars. I um, recently wrote an article. I haven't published it yet, but wrote an article the nonprofit sector is the third largest employer behind retail and manufacturing. Really? 
I had no clue. But I, I mean, I'm in a town like Houston. I'm in Dallas, and it's very, you know, very charitable. Yep. And, very but, charitable cities overall. But I think we we get really stuck in the fact that we don't want to pay for overhead, but overhead is what runs the nonprofits, right? The people, the talent is what keeps everything going and keeps us able to serve people. So I think there are broader metrics that we want to encourage people to look at. What are the outcomes? How are we actually changing lives? Are we just giving a man a fish or are we teaching him to fish? So tell us a story of one of your nonprofits. You don't have to give any names, any kind of example of how you came in and your group came in and helped them and how they're thriving now yeah. based on what you all been able to do. Absolutely. So the client, I'll give their name, they won't mind. Um, I started working with this small nonprofit back in 2018, Soliana Stables. They are an equine assisted therapeutic writing facility for people with special needs. And just last year, we were able to launch their Horses for Hero programs with veterans. Their challenge was you know, they... They're, the founders are amazing. So Andy and Sasha Camacho are just the most lovely people you'll ever meet in your life. And Sasha is the executive director there. They have a daughter who is Down syndrome and she loved writing, but they couldn't find a program that was consistent. I think that's the other challenge when you look at nonprofits. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I know who have gone to, you know, they heard that this food pantry has food available and they got there and stood in line for three hours and then they were out of food by the time they got to the front. There are, with equine assisted writing, there are a lot of facilities out there, but if the volunteer doesn't show up to lead the instruction, then the lesson's canceled for that day. So there's a level of accountability that's missing and they felt called to start this organization and they knew a lot of people in the same boat who needed a program for their kiddos with special needs. One of the things that I never considered was that when you have a child with special needs, they don't have all of the activity options available to them that someone who doesn't have special needs has. And so having that consistency and that community, that, that was their big commitment. We're going to have lessons and they're going to go off every single week on a schedule, no matter what. And the community really rallied around them, but these are working class people. So they started off with a few events, you know, they did a fun run and they did, I can't even remember two other events and they had done that for several years, but really didn't know how to grow beyond. And when I came on, they were raising about $50,000 a year. What I did was help them clarify their message. So went in and really talked about what is that message? What are we telling people that we do? Why does it matter? And what is the cost to the community if we don't do this? How do you get involved and where is your place in all of this? And now they, within their first year of working with me, they doubled their revenue. And then second year, they doubled their revenue again. And they've had consistent 20% growth year over year after that. Um, we're looking, our goal this year is to raise 40% more than we did last year. So a little bit of a boost this year with some different activities. So much of it is figuring out how to tell your story, right. where to tell your story, invite people to become part of the solution, that they become part of the family. And then, you know, this is when people miss so often, provide great donor experiences that we talk about user X all the time in the web world. Why aren't we talking about user X in that the face-to-face -face world and in the giving world? And they've just, um, one of the things I love about working with Sasha is I'll get an idea and I'll call her and I'll say, okay, you're going to think I'm crazy, but let's try this. And she's always on board with trying new things. And it's just been, it's been a blessing to see them get to a place where they have the land that they need to run the organization. They've been able to launch new programs to hire additional folks. And listen, they're still growing. We have a long ways to go with them, but they've come so far. And that's just one nonprofit. Mm -hmm. But I love the, the impact that you're making just with one. But I, I love how you talked about the clarity of message. And that's so important when we talk about marketing, we talk about nonprofits, you talk about fundraising and, and give, you know giving people will not give if they can't, if they're not clear on what, what they're giving to. And Correct. so I love that you start there and you've brought, it sounds like in looking at your website too, you've got some good partners around you that help with the marketing and help with all the areas um, that nonprofits might want. Right. 
correct? Yep. The other thing that I want you to tell the listeners about is how you felt called to write this book. (laughs) Yes. Where that came from, because as you're growing your business and working with all these nonprofits, last year you launched a book. So can you tell us about the book? I did. So I wrote this book, Are You on the Right Bus? Navigating Change on the Road to Success. And for anyone who's read the Jim Collins book, Good to Great, the bus theme will seem familiar to you. I think, you know, we always think about, okay, do we have the right people in the right seat on the bus? Every single one of us is unique and we have different strengths. Those strengths can fit in in any number of different places. But the question then becomes, am I in the right seat on this bus, but am I on the right bus at all to begin with? For me, what really happened with this book was I was um, I was speaking to a group of high school students and it's this amazing scholarship program and they had asked me to come in in their speaker series and to talk about entrepreneurship. So I spend my hour talking about my business and how I started the business and you know going through what we do and how we do it. And at the end, when we went to take questions, the first question that one of the high school seniors asked me was, what do you do when your parents are pushing you to pursue a career that's practical and stable, but it's not your passion? And I realized in that moment that my path to entrepreneurship, having started in this place where I was passionate about Spanish and about rhetoric and about public speaking... And I used that passion and it got me into this career where I learned a lot of great things, but that wasn't my passion. So that's where I made that switch so then I could align my values with my passions to do something truly great in the world. That path was so much more impactful than just talking about being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So around that same time, I was contacted by a publisher who said, you know, hey, we saw your profile. Would you be interested in writing a book? And I started in April and published in September. Good for you. I mean, that was quick. (laughs) But I think that the message was there. And I think when the message is there and you've got the clarity and you've got it inside, you just need to get it out. Exactly. Exactly. I think the other thing too, everyone you talk to, I shouldn't say everyone, but most authors I've talked to have said that their first book wasn't their best book. So I think my advice to someone who's thinking of writing a book, I would say, just do it. Find a framework that works for you and just do it. Make it the best it can be, but don't obsess over it. Don't wait three years to go through and make 50,000 edits and reread it a hundred thousand times. Chances are your second book or your third book are going to be better. But to your point, you know what the message is. You know what you're trying to get out there. What do they always say? That perfection is the enemy of progress. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you talked about not just being in the right seat, but being on the right bus. And I think that's what strengths is all about. What we talk about here is how do we help people know what their unique talents are and use them every day? Because that's where you get energized. And you can see the energy that you feel as you're getting as you're helping, just as you were describing your client and talking about the story and, and, and sharing that, what would you hope that people get from reading your book? And what have you heard since I think you were sharing a few stories yeah. after people read the book? I, the number one thing I hope that people get from my book is courage. The, mm-hmm. One of the common themes that you hear resonate in this book is, listen, there are times when we're not confident. I mean, people always find it ironic if I tell them that I'm feeling insecure and everybody says, what are you talking about? You're the most confident person I know. But we all go through that. And I think, especially any entrepreneur, we all go through imposter syndrome. And so you have these moments where you're not feeling that belief in yourself. So what you read throughout the the stories in my book, and it's it's an easy read, it's a quick read, it's a lot of anecdotes about my life, are these people that come into your lives into your life and they give you courage and they believe in you. And so, so many times throughout my life, I've thought to myself, you know, can I do this? I've never considered doing this. I really don't know. But I know that, I know Mr. Brems believes in me, or I know that John believes in me, or I know that, you know, my, my teacher believes in me or my boss believes in me. And I'm just going to take that leap. I'm going to take every bit of every morsel of belief that they have in me, and I'm going to borrow that until I have it myself and feel it myself. So I think that's the number one thing I would hope people take from this is courage. For me, the most rewarding things have been I've had people reach out and say, 
you know, I used to give back to my community before I had kids, but then thought that once I had children, I don't have time to really make an impact in a volunteer role. But now I realize I don't have to give 30 hours a month to it. You know, I can do something for one hour a month and still make a difference. Um, that's been huge for me because you see people giving back in ways that they can in the season in life that they're in. And we all go through different seasons in our life. The second thing is I, I talk a lot in here about working a job that you hate. And I did have a job at one point. I disliked this job so much that I was going to therapy for the job itself. And here's the clue. If you are sitting in your car before you go into work in the morning, reading positive affirmations to yourself off of index cards, this is a clue that you're not on the right bus, right? This is a clue that you got to get off that bus. And thankfully, I was actually escorted off that bus, got fired from a job. There's a chapter called You Haven't Lived Until You've Been Escorted Off the Bus. Oh, wow. But I think that, you know, we work these jobs we hate not realizing that there's another option out there. You can always go back to the station. You can always pull the cord, get off, reassess, and pick up another bus line. And that's been the other really rewarding thing is people reaching out and saying, oh my gosh, I'm that person. I'm the person who's working a job that I hate. And I realize now that I don't have to do it anymore. And it's just been incredibly gratifying to know that and I think like anything, if you change even one person's life, it's worth it. Well, and you're living that. You're living that. And I think that's the thing, We the message here. We know that one in two people right now are not happy at work and they're contemplating, but they really need direction on, okay, and affirmation. And I would just say to those people, read your book. Yes. Get, get a coach or a mentor. Think about the times in your life you've made a pivot. You mentioned several pivots you had. And how you got through them, yes, yeah. that's going to give you the confidence to go to the next thing. And I, I love what you've done. And think about it: if you, Angela, if you hadn't created this business, Broad Oaks, what in twenty eighteen? Is that right? Yep. Think of all the people. If you weren't there, all the people that wouldn't have gotten to be where they are right now. I, I do think about that and it just, you know, makes you sit back and just be in awe of God's plan for your life. And I think, um, I think about all the people who would be homeless right now if it weren't for the work that I've done. I, I think about all the people who are working in jobs that they love and they're really passionate about because I hired them somewhere along the way. You know, our, our reach is so much broader than what we realize. I mean, I even, I got a text message actually just before we got on here from a former employee that said, you know, you had a vision and you raised the money for it. And now your vision is coming to fruition. And it's a client I, I'm not even working with anymore. And so it just makes you feel like people do see the work that you're doing. But I think for me, being the kind of silent partner behind the scenes and being able to empower these nonprofit leaders to take on that role within their organization, within their community, with the board of directors, and to see them flourish I just think it's the greatest reward in the world to see people achieve beyond what they ever imagined possible. And I love that. When I asked you about the name of your organization, Broad Oaks Consulting, I'm cracking up because you talked about trees throughout. You talked about the Christmas tree. Yes, I know. <laughs> Here we are. Here's the tree. So it's and there's tree of life. I mean, we could go on and on. Yes. <laughs> but um, do tell how you came up with that name, Broad yes. Oaks. So if you've ever been to Houston, there's a restaurant on Westheimer. And Westheimer is, for those of you who have not been here, it's like an eight lanes of um, pavement, really of just asphalt. And right on that road, there's this restaurant. And when you pull through the drive, there are two oak trees there that have been there for over 300 years. And I was getting a hamburger, pulling through the drive through one day, just waiting in line for my food to be prepared and staring at these trees as I was thinking of starting my business and what I would call it. And it occurred to me that for 300 years, despite all of the progress and all of the industry, someone along the way saw the value in these trees. They nurtured them, they fed them, they watered them, they propped them up as their branches have gotten so heavy over time because they beautify the community. And I think about these nonprofits like Soleana Stables, like The Landing, like Raise Up Families, like 
you know, the Riverside Project, like Casa de Esperanza de los Niños here in Houston. They're small organizations, but they're providing beauty and stability and that kind of shade and comfort that people who are hurting really need. And I thought, oh my gosh, we have to care for these organizations. We have to be the one to nurture them, to feed them, to water them, to prop them up so that they're, they can continue to be here for people who are hurting and people who need that shelter and that love. And that's where the name came from. I love it. I love it. So as we get ready to close down and we think about your business, you think about the people, the audience who are leaders, who are difference makers, and they want to make an impact. Any last minute thoughts coming up for you that you want to make sure you share with them before we sign off? I do. And you know, this is so timely. I'm just going to be completely honest and tell you that I've had a really difficult couple of days, very frustrating. And that feeling of just failure. I think we all go through this as business owners where we feel like we're failing at everything and we've made this horrible choice and we should just walk away from it and go back and work a W-2 job. And here's what I will tell you that your success, I know we hear it all the time, but success is not linear. There is a huge part of you that has to believe not only in yourself, but that the work you do matters and that that will always rise to the top. So as you take two steps forward, know that that step back is going to come, maybe even three steps back, but that's okay. It's all going to come together in the end. You just have to keep the faith and keep putting one foot in front of another and think about what is the small thing that I can do today that will make a difference for someone else tomorrow. Oh, I love that. And it's really, your message is strong because it's, don't worry about tomorrow, just be in the present moment. What can you do today? What can you do today? So I love that. Angela, thank you so much. This has been great. People can reach you where? How can they reach you? You can find me. I'm not great about posting on Instagram. It's Angela Burgess HTX, but you can find me on LinkedIn. I do a lot of hosting there. So it's uh, at Broadox Consulting is my LinkedIn handle. You can find me Angela Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S. My book is available on pretty much every platform, whether you're Burns and Noble or Amazon. And the audiobook is also available on practically every audiobook um, platform known to man. I did read it myself. So you get a little bit of the personal flair too, if you go through it. The other thing I'd mentioned just for your, your job seekers and people wondering, I also created this purposeful work self-assessment that you can download on my website, or there's a QR code in the book too. Um, I think one of the fascinating things, and you will know this more than better than anyone on Strengths Finder, is that when we end up working these jobs we hate, and then we go to another job, and we put all the things that we hate about our current job as our strengths on our resume. So really started thinking about that. It's just a little bit of a way to start thinking about what you love and you're good at, what you don't love and you're not good at, what you're not good at, but you want to get better at, and how do we frame that? I love that all about purposeful work. Well, thank you so much, Angel. This has been great. And we can't wait to to hear more about the impact you're making in Houston and beyond. So thank Thank you for being for having me. Yes. You have been listening to Dominate Your Day podcast. If you're ready to transform your life and workplace from the inside out, go to DanaWilliamsCo.com and set up a discovery call. We would love to connect with you and equip you with some helpful resources. Thank you for listening today, and please take a moment to subscribe to Dominate Your Day, wherever you listen.